And I like to say on the bench that child support is, it's not, a, it's not a money grab, it's not a cash grab. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And I say this in court all the time, not too much, not too little. It has to be just right because that affects the children and you want to make sure you try to get it. Alex here with hearing master and family law attorney Lynn Conant, who is with us to answer questions on the overhaul of the child support guidelines. Let's go straight into it. We are here with Lynn Conant, a hearing master, specifically child support, I believe. Why don't you let us know a little bit more about you and what you do? Well, I've been a lawyer in Nevada for almost 20 years. I work, I have a private practice, and then I work part-time for the county as a child support hearing master. In my capacity as a hearing master, I do uh, child support enforcement, I do child support modifications, I do establishment of new um, cases, and the establishment includes findings of paternity or findings there is no paternity, and then I set orders for child support. Okay, so I didn't know that paternity was included there. Um, one of the questions that I get on occasion has to do with the difference between a hearing master and a judge. I suppose before we get started, you might be able to help with that distinction. A judge is an elected official. A hearing master is appointed by, in, the, in my case, appointed by a committee of judges. And so I, while a, a judge works for the community or the city at large and the voters, I work for the judges. I work at their pleasure. Okay, so the first thing I guess I wanted to lead into is the fact that we're going to be going over the new child support regulations. And I use the word new because it is my understanding that Nevada hasn't had regulations in child support before and that this is the first set of administrative code that has been released by the guidelines committee. I don't know if you'd like to sort of elaborate a little bit on I can that. give you a little bit of history. Um, Nevada has had child support guidelines in the past. They were under uh, Nevada NRS 125B. Under those statutes, they, they set up child support guidelines which hearing masters and judges are obligated to follow when, unless there's a compelling reason not to. And the um, legislature then gave us a series of deviation factors where we could increase or decrease support. What is, the federal government has a requirement that child support guidelines are reviewed once every four years. Nevada was not in compliance with that regulation and as a result could lose its funding for its child support court. Well, that would be a huge deficit. So the um, legislature uh, developed a committee. The committee met for, I believe, a period of approximately two years and then came out with new guidelines for child support. So I think that actually answers um, my question at least. So it sounds like maybe we were not compliance before because the legislature was sort of in control of it. Now we have a standing committee that can more, I guess, sort of set like a separate body from the legislature that's able to switch. Yeah, we do have a standing committee appointed. I believe they're appointed by the legislature and that will help keep us in compliance because, because Nevada's legislature only meets one every, once every two years, it's difficult to do a, ref, a full, review of legislation once every four years. You're, there's always a chance you're going to be out of sync and so this committee will now be able to see that we're in compliance with federal guidelines. Excellent. So the number one thing that I get communications on from the public is the formulas have changed, the percentages. Um, I suppose we can go into that first. The formulas have changed significantly. Uh, I think the first thing to understand is for low-income earners we used to have a threshold minimum of $100 per child. If you're a very low income or no income earner, that is, was a significant uh, number many people could not afford to pay. So what the, legis or what the standing committee has done is to develop a formula that is tagged to the federal poverty guidelines. And so we look at individual income, we determine a percentage and then establish threshold minimums from there. I brought the guidelines so I can give you an example. I totally go into those. Okay. Um, previously, if let's say you had a very low income, and the, this starts at an income up to $759. Now, instead of that being 18% of your gross income, it's now 10.56%. Uh, so 10.56% of 759 is $84. 
So on LIBOR, you would be charged 18% before, and it changes dramatically when you have more than one child. Previously, the amount was $100 per child. So if you had 200, two children, it would be 200, three children, 300. Now, if your income is, is below the threshold of 759, for two children, it's $110 instead of 200. For three children, it's $130 instead of 300. And this, I believe, was done in part to recognize the fact that people with low incomes or modest means oftentimes struggle with our prior formula and weren't able to make child support obligations. So I, I, we were setting people up for failure. That's exactly, exactly true. There's, I guess, people on both sides of the aisle. One side focuses heavily on the amount that a child needs, and then the other side focuses heavily on the amount that a parent could pay. And I've always thought that that made more sense because when people are together, if they earn a low income together, they typically make do with what they have. But mm -hmm. suddenly when they separate, those prior formulas sort of change that dynamic. Now that you're separated, you're not good enough. You have to make more or the mm -hmm. law's gonna come down on you. You hit the nail on the head and what I like to say is two can live as cheaply as one as long as they live together. <laughs> it's true. So another question I get, and you wouldn't believe how often I get this question because it's so technical. A lot of people are bothered by how retroactive modification of child support works. And I'm only talking back to the date of motion. Have there been any changes in the regulations with how that works? Because my understanding is that prior it was discretionary. And I haven't taken a look myself, but maybe that has changed. The statute says that you're entitled to child support the month after you file. Even if a court can't hear you for five or six months, you're accruing that obligation. Um, that is oftentimes the case in child support court. And what I'll have is somebody who applies in February may not get a court date until June. So does that mean the custodial parent misses that window of opportunity for child support? Or does that penalize the non-custodial parent because they haven't been paying? What the court has the ability when it looks at child support arrears, particularly in an initial setting, to establish what is fair and reasonable child support. And some of the ways you, uh, child support arrears, some of the ways you establish that is, is you will ask the non-custodial parent, have you made any contributions? And just the other day in court, a gentleman said, uh, yes, I've been giving her $200 a paycheck. And I asked the mother, I said, have you received that? She says, oh yes, he's been giving me $200 a paycheck. It turned out he had actually been giving her more than what he was required to pay. So I didn't find any arrears. That's good, yeah. Okay, and then there are times when um, you, it, quite a bit of the work I do is if the state is involved. And I want to look at this because when, uh, non, or when a custodial parent collects TANA for welfare, the state asks the non-custodial parent to repay the welfare benefits. And we do that through child support. All oftentimes when I'm, I'm on the bench and I'll see perhaps a large number of arrears come about, it, it becomes questionable as, as to whether the non-custodial parent can, can make that obligation of the arrears. I'll ask the district attorney, the deputy district attorney who's presented the case, how much money has the state paid? And sometimes I'll find that the state has paid, i give an example, perhaps $2,000, whereas in full arrears would be $6,000. I, I talk to both the parties and then we'll try to come up with a fair and reasonable amount, understanding that the state should be reimbursed for the money it has spent to help raise someone's child. And I use that as, as a threshold measurement to then make a decision as to what's fair and reasonable. Okay, I didn't know, I actually didn't know any of that, that's great. So we know we discussed statutory minimums, it sounds like they're gone. What can you tell us about presumptive maximums? Presumptive maximums are gone. Uh, what happened is Nevada was, if not the last state, the next to the last state, to get rid of a presumptive maximum. Some states, such as California, believe that both parties should enjoy the same lifestyle uh, so that a child is never 
forced to choose between, let's say, uh, poor dad and rich mom. The person who comes to mind is Britney Spears because she pays quite a bit of money in child support because her ex-husband has custody of their children. So do those children have to grow up saying, well, dad doesn't have a lot, mom does. Let's go live with mom. They don't want that to happen. Now that's one philosophy. Nevada didn't adopt that philosophy. The legislature through um, its decision-making process decided it only costs X amount to raise a child. And then gave us deviation factors where we could increase or decrease that X amount, uh, depending on time the child would spend with either parent, the relative income of the two parties. But Nevada has done away with that statutory maximum. So high income earners will find out that they're going to be paying a bit more in child support. Okay, you touched on deviation factors, which right away is another hot topic. I am only aware of the deviation factor as to a medical benefit premiums. I've heard that there are actually quite a few um, deviation factors that a judge can consider or a hearing master can consider. Um, have the regulations altered any of that? Um, is there anything new with regards to how deviations are determined or decided? We still have deviation factors, but one of the things now we must consider, which has become part of every hearing I'm involved in now, is the cost of daycare. So if a custodial parent has daycare costs, they are entitled to seek contribution for the cost of daycare. This is an area that I suspect will be heavily litigated in the next few years, awaiting an opinion from the Nevada Supreme Court to flush out some of these details. Mm -hmm. Because some of the things that you try to consider, well, if I have a custodial parent, they're deducting the children on their taxes. Well, that's an instant savings on their taxes. Mm -hmm. They're then also getting the child uh, tax care credit so there's additional money for them. So when you're deciding whether or not to reimburse uh, daycare expenses, should you consider those in addition to the cost of daycare? So that's an that's a, a unclear area that's unsettled, and we'll be looking to the Nevada Supreme Court for some resolution on that. Okay, um, uh, quite a, you know, all of the various different things we've discussed, it probably seems, well, for sure, based on the communications I get from the public, it's very overwhelming. And sometimes it can seem to the public that it's just sort of one of those things where child support ends up being set on all of these various factors. And one of the things that I wanted to sort of touch on was just how much a hearing master or judge is controlled by um, at least the statutory authority, the precedent, and how does that link into people taking their cases to the Supreme Court? Because that was just a, just a thing that you mentioned. The legislature has given us very little room um, to deviate from the state formula. That's, very, that would they've be a surprising been statement very to clear. <laughs> they've been very clear about that. Right. So um, I, I can look at the deviation factors um, and the strain. I better have a compelling very compelling reason to stray outside of the enumerated factors. Um, having said that though, child support can be appear complicated to people. People also, and I'm, I'm sensitive to this, people have said it, I feel like I'm being treated like a number. It, it's a numbers crunching court, quite frankly. And I am always dismayed when I have a parent come in who, a non-custodial parent who doesn't have current pay vouchers when we're establishing um, the child support obligation, or who doesn't um, understand how the formula works and what their role in paying child support is. And so for, the, for people who don't understand the numbers or the number crunching or how we get there, I strongly encourage them to either consult with a lawyer or to go to the courts, ask a lawyer program, because it's not a court where you want to walk in unprepared. You should understand the formula and understand how it works. One of the, one of the most distressing things I see is I'll have a non-custodial parent come in seeking a downward modification of their child support, only to find out their child support's going to be increased. 
And it's because they didn't do their research, didn't do their homework ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And so if I have a non-custodial parent seeking a decrease and the custodial parent sitting there looking for an increase, it's very hard. It's, it's difficult. And I like to say on the bench that child support is, it's not, it's not a money grab, it's not a cash grab. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Mm -hmm. And I say this in court all the time, not too much, not too little. It has to be just right because that affects the children and you want to make sure you try to get it right. Right. <laughs> I like that. Um, I noticed that they put a lot of effort in really codifying some of the precedent that we've had on agreements between parents. For example, there have been situations in the past where parties have agreed to never modify child support, which the Supreme Court has dealt with, with publications. But it looks to me like they have in the regulations specifically address some of these problems by requiring certain boilerplate language to be in the court order, by requiring certain facts to be in a, a stipulation with regards to, I guess, the income of the parents. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I, I think one, one of the things that has happened is if you agree to um, a number for child support, the court will accept that, however, you have the burden of showing that it's in your child's best interest. And what some judges do, I know in particular Judge Burton does this, is in her orders you have to disclose uh, what child support would have been except for your agreement. She wants full disclosure there. And I understand that because I've litigated cases where occasionally couples don't share their income information. And months after a divorce or an agreement on child support, Dad will find out mom makes four times as much money as he thought. And then dad's back in court seeking a modification of that child support. So there's good reasons to have everything laid out up front so that you cut off some of that uh, subsequent and uh, unnecessary litigation. Just get it out there so people are making informed decisions. Uh, one more thing I guess I'd like to point out and maybe get some of your help on this, but while a person from the public may have a little bit more difficulty getting sort of in front of the legislature on how they fashion these statutes, my understanding is that the guidelines committee meets periodically and is, my understanding, it's more, they're more approachable that the public can actually go to these hearings. Those are public hearings. Not only are they public hearings, they're broadcast by the state. You can view them online, and I did that several times at these meetings. I found the information on the uh, state's webpage. Okay, so thank you so much for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.